The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, a track star is thrown from his friend's car. Lord God, what is going on? What is going to be the outcome? And his parents are left holding on to a promise. I just immediately heard the Holy Spirit say, he shall live and not die. Then, a deadly diagnosis. That was the first time we heard the words Ebola. One missionary fights for his life. How do I tell my little boy that he's not coming home? Now see what brought him back from the dead. God is doing something. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. For today's top headlines, let's go over to the CBN News Desk. Thanks, Gordon. An historic visit by President Trump restarts nuclear talks with North Korea. The president met with Kim Jong-un for nearly an hour at the DMZ, this after briefly stepping into North Korea Sunday. As Gary Lane reports, it could lead to another historic meeting at the White House. President Trump is back in Washington after making history in Asia. Early Sunday evening, he tweeted this video of his impromptu meeting at the DMZ with North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. My friend. Kim warmly greeted Trump and told him it was good to see him again. I never expected to see you at this place, Kim said. Then the unexpected occurred as Mr. Trump actually stepped into North Korea. My honor. Would you like me to set the press? I'd be very proud to do that. Okay, let's do it. Come on. It was one small step for Donald Trump, one giant leap for U.S.-North Korea relations, when the president became the first sitting president to enter the Hermit Kingdom. Kim, who rarely talks to foreign reporters, told those gathered at the north-south border he was pleased with Trump's willingness to move forward. I believe just looking at this action, this is an expression of his willingness to eliminate all the unfortunate past and open a new future. The surprise meeting came just 32 hours after President Trump tweeted that he'd be willing to meet with Kim at the DMZ, following the G20 summit in Japan and meetings with South Korean officials in Seoul. It followed Trump's first historic meeting with Kim in Singapore and a second summit last February in Hanoi. That meeting ended early and resulted in cooler relations with no future talks scheduled. When he crossed, it caused media mayhem as North Korean security, unprepared for the onslaught of journalists, blocked the way. Later, the two leaders met for nearly an hour. New White House Press Secretary Stephanie Grisham shoved aside a North Korean guard to make room for photojournalists to capture the historic moment. And would President Trump invite Kim to the United States? I would invite him right now to the White House. Before that, lower level talks are expected to resume. But for now, Trump's historic step brings new hope that a deal to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula may eventually be reached. Gary Lane, CBN News. World markets showing positive signs Monday after the U.S. and China announced a ceasefire in their trade war. At the G20 meeting in Tokyo this weekend, President Trump and Chinese leader Xi Jinping announced trade talks will resume. The U.S. will hold off on additional tariffs on Chinese imports, and China will buy more American agricultural goods. U.S. lawmakers expressed concern when the president said U.S. companies would be allowed to sell to Chinese telecom Huawei. The administration clarify that the sales will only be general merchandise, not technology that could affect national security. The Supreme Court won't revive an Alabama law banning a specific abortion procedure. Dilation and evacuation, also called dismemberment abortions, are most commonly performed after 15 weeks. Outlawing the procedure would ban nearly all abortions after the first trimester. A lower court blocked the law and the high court refused to hear an appeal. States across the country are joining the fight against abortion. Kentucky is one of the latest to step up. Leaders there are making a strong statement in the fight for life. Emotions are high and passions run deep in the war over abortion, with the ultimate goal of convincing the Supreme Court to act. Kentucky's part of the pro-life battle may not be making headlines, but its legislative wins could make a big difference in the long run and they hear that heartbeat, how can we say that that's not a child? Because it is one. 
Kentucky State Senator Matt Caslin is the sponsor of Senate Bill 9, or the Fetal Heartbeat Bill, enacted this year. It bans abortion once an unborn baby's heartbeat can be detected, which is around six weeks. Although a federal judge has temporarily blocked the law, Caslin believes it has what it takes to go before the Supreme Court. There's no doubt that this law possibly could make it that far uh, because of it already being challenged the day after we passed it. Abortion survivor Claire Caldwell testified on behalf of Kentucky's heartbeat bill. Um, because I think that seeing the face of an abortion survivor shows the humanity of that unborn baby. And I wanted to share with them that you know, I wasn't my birth mother's body. I was a separate body and I had a separate heartbeat inside of my birth mother's body. The heartbeat bill isn't the only Kentucky effort. Republican State Representative Nancy Tate helped sponsor and enact a bill banning selective abortions. A federal judge also temporarily blocked this law. Who would have ever thought that, um, that we would see this point where we would have to protect our children based upon race, national origin, sex, or disabilities? Kentucky's GOP leaders have made pro-life measures a priority. Since Republicans took control of both the state house and Senate in 2017, the governor is also a Republican and strongly pro-life. To defend those who have no ability to defend themselves, to give voice to the voiceless, is the responsibility of pe people in government. And I'm grateful uh, to have the broad support of people in Kentucky who feel the same way, that feel that, that, sh that life itself is worthy of protection. The Lexington Herald leader reported lawmakers filed a half dozen bills in the 2019 legislative session to limit access to abortion. State Representative Chris Fugit wants Kentucky seen as a leader in the national pro-life movement. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And I think that it's the heart of the legislature here in Kentucky to glorify God, not, not us, but Him. On Friday, a federal appeals court let stand a Kentucky law requiring women seeking an abortion to view an ultrasound of the child in the womb. Americans making holiday plans this week need to be on alert for some severe weather. Storm conditions, including tornadoes, are a threat to the upper Midwest Monday and Tuesday, and extreme heat is predicted for later in the week. In the South and Mid-Atlantic, temperatures in the mid-90s combined with high humidity are making it feel even hotter. Fishing is a popular summertime activity, and recently CBN's Wendy Griffith spent the day with one boat captain who says his main mission is giving others hope. Each morning for nearly 30 years, Captain David Wright Everybody's of High Hope here. Sports <laughs> Fishing in Virginia Promise. Beach sends local fishermen off to sea with a prayer. A great and mighty God, we thank you for the day that you made for us today. We ask for your blessing and protection to be on each and every one of us out here on the water today. We ask you to be with us in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Dave. I really appreciate it. Amen. Thank you, David. Amen. Captain Wright says the prayers began here at Rudy Inlet during a particularly big tuna season back in 1991. We we're actually having a discussion about how good our tuna fishing was. <laughs> and uh, somewhere along the line, one of our captains brought up the idea of saying, you know, we should work together, but we should have a prayer in the morning before we start our day. I said, yeah, it's a great idea. I had no idea it was gonna be me. High hopes, it's more than just the name of Captain Wright's boat. It's the message behind every prayer that he gives and the feeling fishermen say they get when they hear it. Honestly, it kind of gives you like a sense of hope that somebody's, you know, looking out for you. Cause I mean, when you leave the slip and when you leave the inlet, there's, you're at, you know, the mercy of mother nature and everything. So it's always nice to know that somebody's looking out and, you know, um, praying for everybody. 19 year old Haley Harris is one of the few female first mates you'll see around here. What's it like working next to a local legend like Captain Wright? It's really awesome. People come down here looking for him and I'm like, he's just two slips over, go see him, he's the best. Captain Wright says out on the water, fishermen strive to help each other. Today, we saw that firsthand as a fellow charter boat lost power. High Hopes was able to tow the boat loaded with fishermen to safety. You're good, man. 
we'll get you out of the timeline. Captain Wright says whether it's throwing someone a rope, taking families out for a dream fishing trip, or throwing up a prayer, giving hope is the mission. God told me many years ago when I started this, and I didn't know what to, to do, to pray, to say. He said, tell them about me. There's another generation of fishermen that'll come after me. And uh, you know, my hope and prayer is that this carries on. Wendy Griffith, CBN News, Virginia Beach, Virginia. That story will put a smile on your face. Well, stay tuned for more of this 700 Club. Gordon and Terry will be back right after this. A Williamsburg teenager named Juan Pence could be a walking miracle. He survived a serious car accident, and doctors gave little hope that he would survive. Still, his parents prayed he would live and tell the world of God's healing power. Charlie Nehron brings us his amazing story. May 22, 2017, a date that forever changed the life of Juan Spence. The 17-year-old basketball and track star was leaving his high school in a friend's car when the ride took a tragic turn. The friend was speeding and lost control, hitting a signpost. The car went airborne and flipped several times. Juan, who was not wearing a seatbelt, was ejected through the sunroof. The car landed on Juan's head. Juan was rushed to a local hospital. Doctors determined that extreme pressure and swelling in his brain meant they must remove a piece of his skull. I just had to start praying immediately. Lord God, what is going on? What is going to be the outcome? And I just immediately heard the Holy Spirit say, he shall live and not die. The prognosis looked grim. The traumatic brain injury left Juan hooked up on life support. Doctors gave him just a 5% chance of survival, adding if he somehow survived, Juan would never speak or walk again. Elizabeth recalls her reaction to the doctor's negative report. I respect you as a professional. However, you God. don't have the final say so concerning our son. That is what I said. And you said God has I said a God has the final say so, and we will wait to see what God does because I don't believe that's what's going to be the fate of our son. Yeah. And I went over to my son's ear and I said, Juan, this is dad. You shall live and not die. Just speaking in his to ear. To proclaim the works of the Lord. Yes. His parents, both ministers, held on to their faith and rallied prayers from family, friends, and the community. We cried and we held it together, but we continued to speak faith, and we did not waver in our faith. After three days, Juan was out of his coma, but still on life support. The next day, he started to show signs of progress. He began moving his fingers and toes. Three weeks later, to the surprise of doctors, he moved forward to standing, walking, and talking. He says during the coma, he witnessed a spiritual battle being waged for his life. There was a demon coming across in the air, and it was coming towards me. But there was also a golden angel in armor with a sword. And the angel, he slayed the demon, and the vanished. Juan admits his recovery has not been easy. He was in the hospital for more than two months and endured painful physical therapy. It's been very hard. At one point in time, I cried every day. It's basically like how people joke about trying to do something with your hand tied behind your back. I live through that every single day, even today. After three brain surgeries in as many as three months, the high school senior is now back in school. And 197 days after the accident, he returned to the basketball court. It's been a while, huh? Although he still has no voluntary movement in his left arm and suffers paralysis on the left side of his face, Juan remains grateful and sees bigger things ahead. It's only because God had a plan for me. A big change from the way he used to think. Even though my parents were pastors, I really didn't think God was anything because I really thought the Bible was just a book, a book with a bunch of words. I didn't really think anything much of, of it. I didn't really think I needed him, but I need him now. I trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not to my own understanding. Many have been inspired by his miraculous story, including some of those who treated him and doubted his survival. The very doctor is so amazing, the very doctor that um, gave us that, that 
that five percent, he he's now praising the Lord. He yeah. said, I, I believe to, God had the final say so, huh? Yeah. It's according to your faith. Yeah. And we just could not waver. Yes, it was tested, it was tried, but we could not doubt. And I would encourage anyone just to not doubt God mm -hmm. because he is faithful to do what he yes. has promised. And when his word goes forth, it shall not return to you void. And he said he shall live and not die. And that is exactly right what he did. Mm. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. I will live and not die. You'll find that verse in Psalm 118 and declare the glory of the Lord. Jesus can do things that doctors can't. All we have to do is rely on him. Now we're going to be praying for you. We've got another story for you. So Terry's got that. We do. Up next, a missionary to Africa starts feeling a little sick and then collapses when he reaches the hospital. And it was in the same week of the Ebola outbreak. Um, I had to wear all the regalia just to walk in the room and be with him. There was no physical contact. I couldn't hold his hands. Um, any of the normal stuff that you would do on, on somebody's deathbed. See what brought her husband back after being given two to three hours left to live. That's next. Matthew Murray looked into a hospital CCTV camera. Then he uttered what he thought were his last words. This is it. I'm dying. Matthew's body was shutting down, and as he lay dying on his deathbed, his wife Becky was trying to find the right way to break the news to their son. You know, how do I tell my little boy? My little boy was three at the time. How do I tell Josiah that daddy's not coming home? How do I call my mother-in-law and tell her that her son's not coming home? And every dream and every promise that we believed over our lives just appearingly shattered on the floor. Matthew and Becky Murray of Great Britain met on a missions trip. For Becky, it wasn't love at first sight. And uh, we had to pray for people. And I remember the whole team paired up really quickly and the only person left was Matt. And I was like, oh, do not want to pray with this guy. And um, sure enough, we got put together praying for the sick and people were getting healed. And genuinely, my first thought about Matt was, well, it can't be that bad because God's using him. Soon, Matthew and Becky got married and sensed God beginning to speak to them. It was the first time I felt the Spirit of God speak to me. I'd been saved since a little girl, but I'd never heard the Spirit of God speak to my heart. And I felt him say that I would run a children's home. And so it literally, that was not the plan. I wanted to go and study law, um, but sure enough, he's got a better plan than what I had for my life. And so I was doing short-term missions trip for quite a long time until we started our own children's home in Kenya in 2012. King's Children's Home gives shelter to hundreds of kids that live in destitution on the streets of Kenya. They are well-fed, not just with food, but also by the Word of God. After visiting Kenya in 2014, Matthew and Becky made a fundraising trip to the United States, where Matthew began to feel sick. He just started with the usual symptoms of flu and so he got the chills and a fever and I remember giving him paracetamol and thinking oh you'll be fine darling and then um, a few days went by and he just kept deteriorating and getting worse and worse and so we went to the doctor. When they arrived Matthew was placed in isolation for three days. Every sign pointed to a deadly virus. That was the first time we heard the words Ebola. Tragically, he had every symptom of it, and it was in the same week of the Ebola outbreak. Um, I had to wear all the regalia just to walk in the room and be with him. There was no physical contact. I couldn't hold his hands. Um, any of the normal stuff that you would do on, on somebody's deathbed. Alone in a foreign country, it was getting harder for Becky to cope with what the doctors were saying. And one of the really challenging moments was the doctor looked at me and she said, you can't go back to Kenya. She said, you've got a little boy at home who calls you mummy. He's already lost his daddy. And with tears, I just remember saying, but how can I not? How can I not go back? You see, I've got a hundred babies out there who call me mummy and call him daddy too. Finally, the doctors had a breakthrough with Matthew's diagnosis. 
Eventually they found out that he had malaria and we were relieved. Oh baby, a few days on tablets and you'll be fine. Um, we was diagnosed on the Thursday. On the Friday, the doctor pulled me in the room and she said, you have to know your husband's life's hanging in the balance. Um, she started talking about certain organs going into failure. And I remember just thinking, no, no, she, this can't be, you know? Um, and the doctor said, we've just had the pathology results back. And actually his malaria levels have gone to 50%. Now I'm a nurse by background and once your blood is half overtaken with a parasite, naturally speaking, there's no coming back from that. And um, she sat me down in a conference room and she said, he has maybe two or three hours left to live. Uh, we'll give him pain relief until he passes, but he's, it's gonna be a matter of hours. Becky knew that the only hope for Matthew was the power of prayer. So she sent out a Facebook post asking people to pray for her dying husband. Please pray for Matt, urgent. And uh, put my phone down and I'm just praying and just trying to pull myself together. And then I walked out of the room and this nurse beckoned me over and she had a big smile on her face. And I remember thinking, she must not know what I've just been told. She said, I have no idea what's just taken place, but we've just got a second lot of pathology results back and his malaria dro has dropped from 50 down to 10%. And I remember in that moment just thinking, oh my goodness, God is doing something here. God's doing something. Matthew's malaria levels went from 10% down to 5%, and then finally to zero. His miraculous healing shook not just that hospital, but the entire medical community. Everyone was amazed at how this could have happened. Jesus promised me that he would never leave me or forsake me. So although the doctors didn't want to come near me, although the nurses were scared to touch me, Jesus was right there with me. And that's what faith is all about. There was another surprise in store for Matthew when he woke up. I sobbed like a little baby. I cried and cried and cried. When I, I picked up my phone, I looked at Facebook, I had 2,000 messages from people, strangers who I'd never even met saying, we were praying for you. Our church was praying. We stood in the gap, we fasted, we prayed. I was humbled. I thought, wow, God, your church is the most incredible army on the planet to be mobilized so quickly to pray for someone they didn't even know. I thought, this is pretty incredible. If someone doubts in the power of prayer, I would ask them to meet my husband because every doctor had given up on him. The doctors had done all they could with medicine and they did the best they could. They worked as hard as they could. But even the doctors acknowledged that this had to be a miracle because there is no explanation for Matthew's recovery. Today, Matthew and Becky run a ministry called One by One and they continue to share their story of miraculous healing with people around the world. One of the nurses on the ICU unit actually gave her heart to Christ as a result of it because she saw firsthand, medicine didn't do this, God did this. Jesus does things medicine can't do, doctors can't do. He performs miracles. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Just rejoice in that. Rejoice that this is the day the Lord has made. Uh, and, and, and just say, I'll be glad in it. Come into his presence with thanksgiving. Don't thank him for the disease. Thank him for the miracle he is getting ready to do. When you do that, you join in with that wonderful prayer from Psalm 118. That's where that verse, this is the day the Lord has made. It also is the source of that verse, I will not die, but live and declare the glory of the Lord. Now we're going to pray for you. Before we pray, we've got some other miracle reports. Here's Don Donna from Oklahoma. She had ear problems. She was watching the 700 Club uh, just this past month, April 13th. Terry had a word of knowledge. You have something going on with your ears. The problem also bothers the sides of your face. Well, Donna had been asking God for a word on this condition. She received it. Afterwards, her ears began to drain and she has been fine ever since. 
Well, yay, Donna. <laughs> yay, God. Well, this is Irene. She lives in Griffith, Indiana. She suffered with terrible fatigue. It was so bad, she had a feeling of hopelessness. Then a few weeks ago, she was watching this program, and Gordon, she heard you say, there are many who are suffering with chronic fatigue. You have no hope. You don't want to go out anymore. You don't want to do things anymore. You're just constantly tired. God's healing you. Well, instantly, Irene felt strength in her body. She said she got up and began to clean her house and has felt great ever since. What is it about house cleaning? It seems to be the first thing people it do. It's a blessing when you can't do it. <laughs> let's go clean the house. All right. Well, let's rejoice in what God is about to do for you. Let's come to Him in praise and thanksgiving, realizing He inhabits the praises of His people. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for all the things that you do, how you bore upon your own body all of our infirmity, all of our pain, and you have carried it away. So if you bore it, and if you carried it away, we don't have to bear it anymore. So we cast it upon you. We release it to you now. And we declare over ourselves, this is the day yes. the Lord has made. Now stretch forth your hand to give energy and life. And we say, be healed now. In Jesus' name, be healed, be restored, be made whole. And we receive it now. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. For someone you've uh, been diagnosed with tuberculosis, and it's primarily in your right lung, and God is healing you. He's able to restore the lung tissue. He's able to remove the scarring. He's able to completely eradicate that disease from your body now. Just take in a deep breath. And just, just declare, in him I live and move and have my being. And just receive healing into your lungs right now. In Jesus' name. Terry? Now, there's someone, you have a chronic, I mean chronic condition with your feet. Um, you have, I think if this is a woman, because you're so concerned about summer coming up and your feet being obvious to people, but they're cracked, they're bleeding on the bottom between your toes. God is healing that for you right now. You're just going to see that oozing dry up and the skin's going to heal over and your feet will be fine. Well, there's someone you had a fall and in the fall there was some kind of um, uh, blow to the back of your head. Mm. And I get this sort of whiplash. You fell and then there was an acceleration. And so you're dealing with concussion. You're dealing with uh, bleeding within the brain. You're dealing with a whole host of issues. God's able to deal with all of that. And he's able to heal and restore and take all the trauma off of you now. In Jesus' name, be healed and be made whole. Someone else with a chronic eye condition, uh, it causes um, uncontrollable weeping uh, or tearing is probably uh, where you just um, can't ever seem to be normal. And God is able to heal, he's able to restore, he's able to reduce all that swelling, all that discomfort now in Jesus' name. Um, someone else, you have a really unstable gait uh, walk because of some condition that you have, but God is healing that for you right now. You're just gonna be able to walk completely firmly and uh, with, with purpose, and you haven't been able to do that for a long time. No more instability for you in Jesus' name. And someone else with a problem with your right jaw and just um, it just doesn't shut properly. God's healing you, taking all that pain, everything away now in Jesus' name. What you couldn't do before, open your jaw wide and realize God has just healed it completely for you. Someone else with a spinal condition in your neck, pinched nerves. Um, uh, God's just restoring spines now in Jesus' name. Receive it. Receive your healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone else, you have you you are so discontented with your job. 
uh, and you blame yourself because you didn't get education when you could have and should have. You just played instead. God's got something fresh for you. Stop looking at what you don't have and begin to thank Him before you even see it. It's on the way. Amen. Lord, we thank you. Mm. And we thank you for this day yes. that you have made. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. If you've been touched by God, share your report. Let us know. 1 800 700 7000. If you need prayer, we're here for you. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call. We're available seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We're just a phone call away, so call us. 1 800 700 7000. Terry? Well, still to come, meet a military couple who are devoted to their country and to each other. Being a military wife is the hardest job. Being a full-time mom, being a full-time dad when I'm gone. It's always encouraging that he thinks that what I'm doing at home is as important as what he's doing. Watch how this couple receives a hand up at a time when they need it the most. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Taiwan's churches are promoting adoption over abortion. In June, pro-lifers in Taiwan held a rally highlighting the benefits of adoption. Adoption is not widely accepted in Taiwan, but churches are hoping to change that attitude. Pastors from across the island nation came to the capital to support life. One medical group estimates there are as many as 500,000 abortions every year in Taiwan. With Taiwan's decreasing birth rates, the protection of life is a priority and adoption is seen as the best solution. Orphans Promise in Brazil is giving more than 250 children from disadvantaged backgrounds the opportunity to learn and grow. Children struggling with poverty are now receiving food and education assistance, and a new generation of youth is succeeding thanks to the stability, support, education, and life skills they're getting from the ministry. Orphans Promise is reshaping their futures, having an impact for generations to come. And you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to CBN.com slash international. Gordon and Terry will be back right after this. The men and women of our armed forces play a critical role in preserving the freedoms that you and I enjoy every day. And CBN is committed to supporting our military families. Families like Wally and Jenny's, they needed help during a tough time of transition. And that's exactly what they got, thanks to people like you. There is nothing quite like watching a U.S. Navy ship pull into port and seeing the excited family members ready to welcome their sailors home. Jenny took care of the house and two kids for six months while her husband Wally was deployed. Now that he's home, they do lots of fun things together to give them time to reconnect as a family while they anticipate the birth of their third child. Wally is quick to praise Jenny for all she does. Being a military wife is the hardest job. Being a full-time mom, being a full-time dad when I'm gone, yeah, that makes a whole world of difference in how I go about doing what I do. It's always encouraging that he thinks that what I'm doing at home is as important as what he's doing. It helps that we both understand that what we're doing when we're not together is equally as important and just as hard. Wally is a Navy chaplain's assistant, but recently he felt God calling him to be a chaplain. To do that, he'd have to leave the Navy and go to school to earn his divinity degree, and then rejoin the Navy as a chaplain. But it would take a while before Wally's school benefits would kick in, which meant no paycheck for a few months. But the couple felt God calling them to move forward. They would need to put some important things on hold. Their dishwasher was broken, and their backyard fence was a hazard. Plus, their daughter was starting school in the fall and needed clothes and school supplies. The couple sat down to budget. On paper, it wouldn't be enough, but Wally and Jenny had faith. If God is sufficient, then He's provided for us here and now, and then He will eventually provide more. 
CBN's Helping the Homefront heard about the couple's story and wanted to help. Their pastor, Trace Martinez, told them the good news. Generosity. When I shared uh, the need that you guys had uh, based on your decision to follow after the Lord, they said, how can we help? And so... Pastor Trace told them CBN would cover their mortgage until Wally's benefits kicked in. We would also buy them a new dishwasher and fix the fence. That's pretty amazing, right? Yeah. Now you, you talk about just wanting to see God's faithfulness and you stepping out and then seeing it happen before your eyes. This is it. But there's more. They are going to help you in terms of providing groceries uh, for your family in the form of a thousand dollars. But oh God. <laughs> there's still one more thing that they would like to do. And I think this is just really neat. They realize that Abigail's starting school this fall and, and that there's a, a new little one on the way. And so they are going to take you shopping and buy school supplies, baby supplies, whatever you need, $600 worth of provisions to meet that need. They want to help get you set up for success come the fall, come the new baby. Oh, I'm extremely grateful. It feels like a huge burden has just been lifted off of our shoulders. CBN took the family shopping to buy clothes for the kids and items for the baby. Then Wally and Jenny picked out a dishwasher and chose the design of their backyard fence. The work was complete in time to welcome their new daughter into the family. Wally can now focus on his studies as he looks forward to rejoining the Navy as a chaplain. We wouldn't have been able to do this without the help of CBN, so I'm just very, very grateful. I love this couple, just doing life faithfully, believing that God's going to meet their needs somehow, even though they can't see where that's going to happen. And then the answer comes, and it comes because of people like you, 700 club members who are out to make a difference in the lives of people everywhere. But isn't it wonderful when it's our own military that you and I can bless in such a significant way? You know, we often say, publicly even to our military, thank you for your service. But there's an opportunity through helping the home front to step in and to make a difference in the way that really changes their lives and touches them right at their point of need. That's just one of the things that you do when you're a 700 Club member. Would you join with us today as we reach out to people all around the world in need? Our number's toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I want to join the 700 Club. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a club member. Our thank you is to send you Power for Life teachings. You'll get one of these every single month. It's a teaching that we get here as a corporate body at CBN. We want to share that with you. So thank you in advance for your giving. Well, coming up, after a drunk driver crashes his car, a policeman gives him an unusual summons. He said to me, I'm not going to write you all these tickets, but you know what? You need Jesus. And I said to myself, uh, you're right. You know, you're right. I do need Jesus. See how this man loses all desire to drink after 25 years of alcoholism. As a boy, Wayne Hardy vowed he would never be like his father, but that's exactly how he turned out. Then, after 25 years of drinking, Wayne got behind the wheel of a car and crashed into a ditch. Wayne Hardy was raised by an abusive, alcoholic father. The worst beating I remember is, I believe that I was maybe seven years old. It came with the drinking. Wayne's mother got the worst of the abuse. My mother be bleeding and uh, things be broken, thrown over the house. At times he would beat her down and drag her. When Wayne was a teen, his father abandoned the family and Wayne became the man of the house. At first, the responsibility came as a relief. I felt like I was important. Over all the years of seeing him abuse her, you know, I was able to help stop him from doing that. But eventually, Wayne's resentment towards his father and his newfound freedom led to darker things. He soon dropped out of school and joined a gang. We went out and robbed people and broken people's houses. I became more of a violent person than of this uh, nice person that I used to be. Before long, Wayne was addicted to the exact same substances that ruined his childhood and his family. At first, it, it was fun. It, 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 you know, partying all the time, it was fun. And it wasn't uh, 
the, you know, the hard stuff, it got to the point where it wasn't uh, strong enough for me. So we went to, to the hard stuff, uh, drinking alcohol, uh, whiskey. I got addicted to it and, and, and to the point where when I wanted to stop, I couldn't. I'm drinking to feel better, but you end up feeling miserable. Wayne was even abusive to his girlfriends. I saw what my father did. I saw him, how he treated my mother, and that stuck with me. And I took that trade on. By his 30s, he was drinking a fifth of whiskey a day, and his driver's license had been revoked for almost a decade. But Wayne says a near-fatal drunk driving accident in the pouring rain actually saved his life. The van flipped into the ditch, and as it flipped into the ditch, because I think I was doing like 75 or 80, and when it flipped in the ditch, it just slid on the side. And as it came to a stop, I, I come out the driver's side of the window. Wayne was able to escape the accident unharmed, and eyewitnesses called the police for help. And then I saw the state police come. I know I'm going to be doing some time. My mouth made up that I'm going to be doing some time. And even as the, uh, the police officer asked me to step over to his vehicle, um, I just put my hands behind my back. The hit wrote me out like at least about seven or eight tickets. And uh, when I told him all these things that I'm, I'm, you know, I know I'm going to jail and I know I'm going to be there for a long time, he said to me, um, you know, I'm not going to write you all these tickets, but you know what? You need Jesus. And when he spoke that to me and I looked over at him, it's like something just left out of me and I felt a relief at where peace came over me when he said that. I'm sorry. And I said to myself, uh, you're right. You know, you're right, I do need Jesus. Two weeks later, Wayne went to church and went forward for prayer at the end of service. I finally got there to the preacher and he, he, he asked me, he said, what do, what do you want from the Lord? And I kind of whispered on my voice and, uh, you know, said, I want to know Jesus. The next morning, Wayne says he felt his desire for alcohol begin to disappear. And the Lord spoke to me and told me, he said, uh, every time you want this drink, I want you to read my word. I, I went to the Bible 16, 17 times. Every time I wanted that drink, after three days of doing what God told me to do, I didn't have that desire no more for the alcohol, it was gone. About 25 years of being an alcoholic, I did not have the desire to drink no more. Wayne says that his life began to transform in ways he couldn't even imagine. He says it was not only a fresh start for him, but for his entire family. He married his longtime girlfriend, Sandra, and they have a healthy, respectful marriage and children who love God. To know God is a, is a new life. To know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is a new life because you're a whole different person. He can help someone else. He can heal someone. He can deliver someone. He can set someone free. I know that what God has done for me, He can do for somebody else. I don't know what your emptiness is today, but what I do know is only God can fill it. You know, when life brings pain to us, when it brings brokenness to us, like Wayne's childhood did. There's something in us that when we don't know God says, you know, I, I can fix this. And we start looking for things, whether it's relationships with people, uh, whether it's belonging to a gang because they feel some kind of a need for relationship in your life, alcohol, drugs, whatever it might be. We try to make it work for ourselves. It just doesn't. It doesn't because we're created with a God-sized vacuum in our hearts that only He can fill. And so today, as you're watching Wayne's story, if, if you're saying, you know what, I need God too, well then move on it. Do something today because God's been waiting for you all this time. He's waited and watched you slog through all of the choices you've tried to make for yourself, the things you've tried to use to fill up the emptiness inside of you. But today's the day for you to come to him. That's his voice speaking to you. You do need Jesus. And it doesn't matter whether you're getting a reprieve from a bunch of tickets that you should have had, or, or maybe just you've come to the end of yourself. Jesus is saying to you today, I'm here, come home, come home. I wanna say today, surrender surrender. Just give it up. God will help you get free from whatever it is that's got you stuck in your life. So let's pray together. Would you do that with me right now? Would you just invite him into your life? It really is that simple. It's the beginning of a journey, a lifelong journey that will change everything. 
all of your battles, all of your addictions, all of your troubles, all of your loss, today you can have a fresh beginning. Pray with me. Jesus, I don't know why I have not come to you sooner. I just keep thinking I can do this on my own, but today I'm tired and I'm spent. I've done everything I know how to do and it just hasn't worked. I know I should have come to you first and I'm coming to you as a last resort and I ask your forgiveness for that. But today, I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior. I'm acknowledging that I am a sinner and I need my sins to be forgiven. I need my heart to be changed, my thinking to be changed. I need you. So will you come into the center of my being? Will you give me that new beginning, that new start that I keep hearing about? But help me, help me to live for you. Help me to live with you inside of me. I admit I don't know how to do that, but it's what I want. So will you be the Lord of my life, the Savior of my soul? Will you teach me to live for you and give me a new start? I give all that I am and all that I have to you today, Jesus. Thank you for waiting for me. In your name I pray. Listen, if you've just prayed that prayer, we've got a free packet for you. It's called A New Day. It'll share with you how do you move on from here? How do you live for Christ? It's yours when you call our toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I'd like the New Day packet. We leave you with these words today from Psalms 103. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things He does for me. God bless you. See you Monday.